Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Someone wants to know, who was it that asked this question? Jeff Stevens wants to know if you're going to get in trouble for spilling the beans. Uh, no, they tried that once and it didn't work out too well. Um, okay. In 2007 or eight, I was granted whistleblower status mm -hmm. because of the, that was going on in, uh, Oh, I probably can't say that. No, that's right? fine. <laughs> Good year. On in, uh, San Francisco on a case I was working okay. and, uh, they tried me once. They won't try me again. Okay. No, I'm retired and, uh, you know, I'm a free citizen and I'm just telling the fact they're, they know where to find me. Sue yeah. me if I'm lying. Mm -hmm. So you've had, it sounds like you've had some run-ins with the ATF yourself, uh, or is it just this one instance that uh, became a thing? Oh, no. <laughs> so obviously you apparently not gotten to that part of the book or mm -hmm. didn't do your due diligence before you interviewed me. Mm -hmm. um, the Google of Ben Sheffield, ATF, I did a three-part CNN mm -hmm. expose on retaliation and retribution within the ATF. Um, mm -hmm. I was on Fox News probably 10 or 12 times during Fast and Furious. Okay. And I set up a website, cleanupatf.org, mm -hmm. um, which ultimately forced them to negotiate with me and settle my case. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't end any of the but I, I got yeah. my vindication. Right. So I'm not trying to say that I know about it, because I, I, I honestly didn't know about it. But, you know, it, it'll be nice to tell the folks how, how we got into, uh, how you got into that particular situation. Kermit Loves Bacon was asking us, he happened to be asking, he says, what's your thoughts on Fast and the Furious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you get into this situation, if you could lay it out? Obviously, I would encourage everyone out there to go get the book. Uh, and support Vincent out there. Um, you know, as you heard him say, I'm going through the book right now. Not going to lie to anyone, but it's very interesting. You know, he's actually, when I listened to this book, I thought this guy's going to be interesting. But actually uh, meeting him and talking to him here, which this is the first time, he's even more interesting. So tell us okay. how you got into trouble. Oh, Lordy. All right. So I was a senior agent. I was probably, I was the most senior agent in the San Francisco field division. We were asked to come in and oversee a case. Politics were running rampant on the case. And I told the bosses, I'll take this case on. They, they asked me to take the case mm -hmm. and I said, I'll do it, but I have to be in control. Mm -hmm. Um, because we got some crazy stuff swirling out there. Um, it was worthy of investigation, so I said I'll do it, but I got to make the calls. Well, the locals who we were working with, and it doesn't matter who, it's probably on the Internet. I know it's on the Internet, but the locals we were working with, we got frustrated. We had inserted undercovers, and we were prepared to go for the long term. They wanted to go for a wiretap immediately, sew this guy up. They had a real vendetta of vengeance against this ex-cop. And I said, now nah, we got in undercovers inserted. We're going to work it traditionally the way we do it. And if they're bad, we'll get them. If they're not, we won't. And they started pursuing a wiretap behind my back. Mm. When I found out about that through the United States Attorney's Office, the U.S. attorney came up and said, you guys are way out of line. You don't have anywhere near the probable cause for a, a wiretap, and you need to just back down and continue on the, the route you're going. So I thought we were good. Come to find out they were pursuing a wiretap behind my back anyway on the state level. Hmm. I raised hell with my bosses. They told me, play nice, just go, go along. And I said, there's no basis for a wiretap. We've not exhausted all of our resources, which is one of the predicates to getting a wiretap. You don't get to just go in and say, I know this guy's dirty. I want a wiretap. Mm -hmm. You have to exhaust traditional investigations, undercovers, surveillance, 
Um, you have to do all these things. And then finally the court will go, well, the only way to get the evidence is probably a wiretap. So we'll give it to you. Is this before or after Homeland Security or the, the, uh, you know, because I know some of that stuff's changed after 9-11. Well, no, that's for like national security. We're talking yeah. about local gangsters. Okay. And that, that doesn't fall under the FISA rules. Okay. So it's traditional wiretap. Okay. And I said, no, we can't do it. Not going to do it. And they said, play nice. And I said, can't play nice. It's going to be an illegal wiretap. Mm -hmm. And they told me, well, then you're off the case. I said, that's fine. And, uh, and uh, so if, if you were to have gotten an illegal wiretap on this, this person, could that jeopardize the case when it actually went to trial? Well, that's what happened. Mm. <laughs> I'm getting ahead. Okay. That's okay. exactly what happened. So I had been vocal about the illegal wiretap. ATF just said they were going to transfer me to North Dakota. <laughs> I was literally transferred six times in 16 months, reprimanded three times, suspended twice. Wow. And every one of them were overturned. Every one of them, the Merit System Promotion Board or the Office of Special Counsel reversed. They said he didn't do anything, mm -hmm. but they kept coming and coming. Imagine, I got three teenagers in the house. They're trying to finish high school, and I'm telling them, you might finish in North Dakota. Yeah. So That's like sending that, you to Siberia or something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. So it pissed me off. And I made the decision to stand my ground, and we entered into a lawsuit, mm -hmm. uh, Office of Special Counsel complaints, EEOC complaints, and they ultimately settled with me. Um, but in the midst of that, mm -hmm. because I stood up that website, cleanupatf.org, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. If you guys go to cleanup atf.org you'll see some really trippy stuff in there okay I'm, I'm showing the book because someone wants to see the book again um and lola has a link out there also if you're looking for the book mm -hmm. everybody in the bureau was mm -hmm. airing their complaints on cleanupatf.org and it, really it became oh it became such a month doj wanted to shut us down but there's a freedom of speech thing and all that okay so in the process of that here, I'm just basically trying to fight for my life and keep my career alive. And a couple other people chimed in. They're doing the same thing to me and whatever. All of a sudden, one day we get an email or a posting on there. Um, I'm a whistleblower, but I don't know what to do. Um, they've been telling me let a bunch of guns go to Mexico and we'll find them mm. late. John Dodson, obviously. Ooh. Mm. And uh, then it blew up. It was it was off the hook. So then I ended up becoming friends with the Terry family. Brian Terry was the border patrol agent killed with fast and furious guns. Right. And we just pressed and pressed and pressed and pressed. And John and my good friend, my my partner in California when I first started, Darren Gill, um, all testified before Congress and blew it out of the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as as usual, nothing significant happened to any of the perpetrators. Yeah, I mean, that was in the forward of the book, you know. Um, this became, this eventually became a big thing. There were million, millions of dollars were spent investigating this. And ultimately, no one paid for it. Um, even the people who were buying these guns um, illegally and then taking them across the border didn't actually the pay boss, for this. The boss who was threatening the agents if you like expose this or don't go along with the program you can quit atf that dude is like a supervisor right now mm -hmm. yeah and if i'm not so okay so here's a little bit of history for me um one of my friends mike daddy i don't know if you've ever heard of mike daddy i, I love mike i know mike well oh okay he's a good dude uh, also a Marine, and um, you know he went through this whole thing, right? When there yeah. were guys coming to him, he was an F. He is an FFL. That was during a wide receiver, I think. Right. Yeah, wide receiver. So, were you in the agency during wide receiver? I was, but I had no clue until okay. it hit cleanupatf.org, mm -hmm. and when the Fast and Furious stuff was blown up, and CBS uh, Cheryl Atkinson, right. 
what a stud she is. Yeah. She, uh-huh. she lost her job because of that. Yeah. But, um. She's still out there kicking though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, she is. And she's still got her lawsuit against the federal government. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. fingers crossed. Because, dude, they were, like, remotely accessing her computer. And, come on, that's some communist Nazi Right well, that's there. what they did to Mike, right? I mean, I think that they try to delete. Well, they did delete stuff off of Mike's computer, but they didn't realize he had backups. Um, you know, he went undercover, so to speak, working with the ATF, only with to have the them. T- yeah, only to have them turn on him. You know, um, say it ain't so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, what do you think? What was the name of the agent that he was working? Was it Dodds? Um, what was the name of the agent that he was? There was an ATF agent in, involved in this whole thing, but that guy wound up just being like pushed into a closet or something like that. I know who you're talking about, but it, I, I can't think of his name off the top of my mm-hmm. head. Yeah. What do you? So, have you seen that? Uh, is that the only time you've seen that kind of thing happen over at ATF? Obviously, it happened to you. Also, they were trying to like push you out to Siberia here, get rid of you. It was. It was a different time in ATF. I had not seen that level of vitriol from headquarters, like a us and them mentality. I had not seen that for most of my career. It loomed out there. There was always that thread of, you know, you better be on the team, but it wasn't near. They just went blatant in you know, 2000 and just didn't care. We, we, there was a bunch of managers who were up there that were, they were the Miami mafia. Mm -hmm. What do you, can you give us some insights on all that? I'm interested. I don't know if Patrick has a different question, but Mm -mm. I, I would like to know your insight of this whole, if we're looking at this thing holistically of, you know, the whole idea that you can, Uh, track these guns as they go across the border into another country and then actually be able to do something about that. Okay, in theory, Mm -hmm. with the right resources and the right person running the show, Bill Newell was not the right person. George Gillette was not the right person. They were cutting corners and what have you. Mm -hmm. Had we, like, hooked up with the State Department or certain intelligence agencies tracked those firearms and had assets on the Mexican side of the border. Problem was, my buddy Darren Gill was the attache in Mexico. Okay. He was the ad ATF guy in Mexico and they weren't telling him. And when he started hearing this, you know, getting glimmers that guns were coming across Mm -hmm. and they weren't being notified. Mm -hmm. He fought it, and they told him to shut the fuck up, or you'll be out of Mexico. Wow. Yeah. So, okay, he wasn't aware. Was Mexico aware, to your knowledge? Well, they started to become aware, Okay. but they couldn't get any information. Mm -hmm. Darren would call the sack of Arizona Bill Newell, who was overseeing this whole straw purchase, video, track, whatever um and bill knew would tell him none of your business is an arizona operation mm-hmm. stay out of it yeah well bill knew was letting all these guns go across the freaking border and the agents were screaming like why aren't we taking these guys down yeah so sack is uh what is that uh, uh something agent in charge or what what is sack special, say? Agent, special agent okay bill knew was a the head poobah over Fast and Furious. Okay. He was in Arizona. John Dodson worked for him. Uh, George George Gillette was the assistant special agent in charge. And that when these agents were screaming, like, why don't we taking these guys down? Let's take them now. They'd say, no, let them go. So John Dodson tried... You know, God bless John. I love John. John's a good dude. But he went to Radio Shack and tried to buy some transmitters and, (laughs) like, create his own. Which, when you're in a billion nine agency, you shouldn't have to do that. No. We should have the -the state-of-the-art tracking equipment. Right. But they weren't interested in that. 
Mm-hmm. So John tried to track them. The batteries died. They didn't work and everything. And these guns are showing up. And John went to him and said, dude, um, we're going to end up one morning. We're going to wake up and somebody's going to say an ATF agent or a federal agent was killed with one of those guns we let walk. And sure enough, Brian Terry was killed with one. Mm-hmm. Um, do you – so I, I've always kind of been of the opinion that – Letting guns walk across the border was some sort of. Uh, there was more to it than just trying, obviously, to track criminals. Do you feel the same way? Was there something that they were trying to get out of it from the I Second can, Amendment side? Well, all I know, and I don't draw any inferences, I'm just a brick agent. All I know is after all that happened and Brian Terry got killed and all those guns were killing like hundreds of Mexicans down across the border. They were able to get a temporary um, multiple purchase ban on rifles in Texas, across Texas. Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. Many people have speculated that this whole operation was to go, oh my God, there's hundreds of guns in Mexico. We got to stop gun sales in Texas and Arizona and wherever. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't tell you that's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we we felt that way too. We're talking thousands, right? Thousands of guns. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, 2,000. Yeah. Um, And hundreds have shown up on innocent Mexican bodies like schoolhouses and and neighborhoods that the cartels want to terrorize mm-hmm. and they came directly from us and we could have stopped them yeah mm-hmm. it's sad to me if you look at vice and all the other documentaries out there of like the um you know basically like a holocaust that, that's going on in mexico i think in some cases still going on to this day to to imagine that we allowed these guns to go over there right and and um and and take out all these people and then no one, no one out there actually paid the price for this. Not the criminals taking it across, not the people who allowed it, not the politicians. Well, the criminals, the, criminals um, the federal government's done a pretty good job. I think they got all the shooters in the Brian Terry case. Mm-hmm. And they've indicted multiple cartel people that had those guns and mm-hmm. were involved in the homicides, but nowhere near 2,000. Mm-hmm. And... No one in our government suffered for letting it happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, our sole purpose in life, we have one mission. We have one job in ATF. That Mm -hmm. is to stop guns from going to bad people, Mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Not good people, not citizens, not, you know, families. Mm -hmm. We have one job, Mm -hmm. and we screwed it up. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty sad. I think I think it's a tragedy. This this I mean, as a gun guy, that's that's not the purpose uh, of the guns, as far as I'm concerned. That's not the well. Look, I I think that uh, people decide to do bad things, right? The guns are tools, all of that kind of stuff. But why do we have these laws? Why is there agency, um, you know, defending these laws and going out there and doing it? And I know from just. From, from what I've heard in the book, what I've heard from you, that your whole purpose here, right, was to stop the bad guys from getting these things. Like, how do the people at the top of the ATF during that time, how do they live with themselves? And how are those guys still out there, like, getting promotions, making money, and, and all this kind of stuff? You know, how, how's this happening? Dude, that's a million-dollar question, and um, it's sad. It's sad that that went on was allowed to go on when we had one job and that was to keep the guns out of the bad guys hands Mm -hmm. yeah um okay nobody nobody in fast and furious was significantly disciplined at all from uh bill newell on down yeah up to deputy director and some of the guys, like, you know, if you think about the guys, so, you know, your guys on your side, other uh, agents, some of those guys were punished. Or, you know, I don't know, I think 
I think there's still some people who are out there working. They're at the ATF technically, right? Uh, because they can't get rid of them, but they're getting treated like crap. Then there's people like Mike Deddy who just got, you know, like a ton of bricks dropped on him, you know, in that whole thing. It's, I don't know, man. And then no one, no one's going to pay the price for that. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to the U.S. government, buddy. Yeah, it's, uh... You know what? They paid me a bunch of money to settle my case, and not one person who is perjured under sworn testimony, it's on documented, mm -hmm. not one of the bosses involved were disciplined. They just paid me off, and they went on rocking like they always would. Yeah, uh, Kermit Loves Bacon has a question here. Um, he says, what happened to the dealers, a.k.a. gun stores, those guns got picked up in? Um, Generally, nothing. Um, specifically, there were some FFLs who were working with ATF. Mm -hmm. um, when they got uncomfortable with like letting all these guns go to what were obviously Mexican nationals or they're heading for Mexico, mm -hmm. they were told to stand down, shut the hell up, or your FFL could be in jeopardy mm -hmm. and, and what have you. But generally speaking, nothing. They, um, they were on the right side of the law. They did what they were supposed to do. And for ATF to try to do something or retaliate against them mm -hmm. would have been a massive, you know, lawsuit and yeah. publicity. I mean, in a lot of cases, you have to realize that a lot of these FFLs were reporting this to the ATF. And the ATF was telling them to let these things go, to not do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fact. So, um, and I don't think, I don't, I think if they were doing that, they shouldn't be held responsible. Just like, you know, Mike Daddy put himself out there and, and went. No, when, uh, when ATF walks in, we flash the badge and we say, look, this is what we got going. Mm -hmm. Just let it go. We will track it. We got it. Mm -hmm. and everything you're not going to be held accountable mm -hmm. everything's lovely you know the ffl is like hey this is my livelihood atf says it's okay atf says it's okay yeah um i i probably should try to make some plans to get you and mike uh on a show one of these days um at the same time make sure to check out hankstrange.com you can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts